My name is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the evening services for Sunday, July the 30th. Per usual, we'll sing a few songs. We sing from Songs of Faith and Praise uh, here at Northfield. I will give you the name of the song and the number. Uh, if you don't happen to have that book and uh, you have a way to get the song and sing along with us, that would be great. Uh, we will also uh, observe the Lord's Supper. And I have a message for you that I hope that uh, will be beneficial and edifying in some way. So let's start out with number 238. You are the song that I sing. 238. You are are the song that I sing. We'll sing it through twice. <clears throat> you are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the mighty God, you are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the songs that you gave to me, you are the songs that I sing. You are the words and the music, you are the song that I sing. You are the melody, you are the harmony, praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the mighty God, you are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the songs that you gave to me, you are the song that I sing. Uh, number 116. God will make a way. God will make a way. One sixteen. <clears throat> God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will make a way. Our song before the Lord's Supper is number 300. And 66 by Christ redeemed. <coughs> by Christ redeemed. <coughs> by Christ redeemed and Christ restored. We keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord until he come. His body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread. And 
as we drink, we see the blood until he come. And thus that dark betrayal night with the last advent we By one bright chain of loving right until he comes. I think the words to this song are very, very fitting as we gather about the Lord's table. Uh, we come to understand that in God's infinite wisdom that he sent his only begotten son to earth. That son became a sacrifice for our sins. The greatest event that ever happened on the face of this earth was the crucifixion, uh, the death, and the resurrection of God's son. And so as we gather about the table, we remember that sacrifice. It was a cruel way to die. It was uh, the Romans' piece de resistance as far as capital punishment was concerned. It was humiliating, it was painful. And uh, let's, as we gather about the table, remember all of those things that Jesus underwent so that we could have forgiveness of sins and a home with him one day in heaven. It says his body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful that uh, in your wisdom that you sent Jesus to us. We are grateful that in submission to you, that Jesus was willing to die this terrible death. We remember the agony that he must have felt as his body uh, had nails driven into his hands and his feet. As we think of that agony and we partake of the bread, we remember the body of our Lord. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The song says, and as we drink, we see the blood. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. We are so grateful that Jesus was willing to shed his blood, his innocent blood. We're so grateful that he was willing for a time to take on the sins of the world and become the perfect sacrifice for each of us. Help us to remember that blood is the blood of our salvation. It is the blood that washes away our sins. So as we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to remember how important that sacrifice was and how important the blood that he shed was. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Concluding the Lord's Supper, uh, we uh, take this time to remember giving back to the Lord. It is connected to the Lord's Supper, isn't it? Because Jesus gave to us, God gave Jesus to us, Jesus gave his life for us. And so as we think about giving back to the Lord, let's just remember all those verses in our Bibles that that talk to us about giving back, that talk to us about uh, these things that we have are just temporary, that these things that we have came from the Lord in the beginning. And so as we give back, help us to give back cheerfully, help us to give back willfully, and help us to give back uh, in such a way that it will be a sacrifice to us, just as Jesus sacrificed himself for us. Let's pray for the giving. We're just grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that not only do we have the means, but that we have the opportunity to give back to you. Each Lord's Day, we remember all the wonderful gifts 
that you have given to us. As we read through our Old Testaments and New Testaments, you have always been a giving God. Help us to give back to you some small part of uh, what we have earned, that uh, it will be a sacrifice to us. And we just pray that those that use these monies will use it for their intended purposes, that your word might be spread and the needy might be helped. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The last song we'll sing is number 578, We Will Glorify. 578, We Will Glorify. <clears throat> We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Oh, I enjoyed <coughs> singing. Uh, I hope that you had the opportunity to sing with us. And I just pray that the Lord was praised because the Lord deserves our praise. He has our creator, our redeemer, and Jesus is our savior. If you were there this morning, uh, you heard that uh, the title of our lesson this evening is The Servant's Opportunity. The Servant's Opportunity. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 2, the writer says, When pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. Let me read that again because it's a rather important verse. When pride <laughs> comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. We have that word pride popping up here. Pride often keeps us from being what we are supposed to be. Now, by the way, uh, there are ways in which pride is good. We should have pride in ourselves. We should have pride in our accomplishments. We should take pride in the fact that we love our God. But there is that type of pride that that works as a, as a stumbling block for many. And that's the pride that we are going to look at this evening. Pride, according to this verse, is the arch enemy of wisdom. And for that reason, anything that stirs up our sense of pride and our self-sufficiency is something that will hinder us from gaining wisdom. I hope that statement was clear and concise. Anything, anything that stirs up that sense of pride, that sense of self-sufficiency, that means that I do this all by myself, is something that will hinder our wisdom. And while that is true, the things that humble us are the things that remind us of our dependence on God. And those are the things that will increase our wisdom. So whatever 
whatever increases pride decreases wisdom. Whatever increases pride contributes to the foolishness of man. Now, there is some irony in all this. I don't know about you, but I love to read. I love to read novels. I, of course, love to read the Lord's Word. Uh, I love to read the news of the day. Most of you know I'm a sports fan, so I like to read about my favorite team or teams or, or what's going on in the sport that is in season. And by the way, that's okay. Now, does that contribute to <laughs> wisdom that's uh, absolutely necessary? No. These are, are kind of fringe things, but they do enrich our lives. The Lord doesn't uh, try to hinder us from enriching our lives. Now, here's the irony. Sometimes learning can get in the way of our wisdom. Sometimes learning, learning more, gaining more knowledge can get in the way of our wisdom. The, <laughs> the more, <laughs> and here is the irony, I think, the more we learn and the wiser, get this in quotes, the wiser we think we are in comparison to the ordinary people, the less wise we become in actual fact. Now you're saying, whoa, 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 hold on now. You got this, you got this all backwards. Well, let's look at the words of the Apostle Paul and see if we do have it backwards. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 2, Paul wrote, if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows yet nothing, yet as he ought to know. Hmm. Do you get that? If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. And with that, there was an advisory from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 18. He says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. And so the irony that I talked about, the irony that even our learning can get in the way of wisdom is in fact scriptural. It is scriptural. It says, if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Sometimes we know a lot of things and these are the things that are not necessary for spiritual living. And then he says, don't let anybody deceive you. Don't be deceived. If anyone seems to be wise in this age, he says he ought to become a fool that he may become wise. The great uh, Charles Spurgeon uh, caught, uh, I think, the essence of this with a very, very vivid metaphor. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said. The doorstep to the temple of wisdom is a knowledge of our own ignorance. You see, we need to go into it with ignorance if we are to learn the important things of life. Now, you know what? In, in the corporate world, uh, very often, we look at wisdom as the thing that helps us to climb the corporate ladder of life. We generally think, 
and I, I, I know this is a very general term, to think that the master, maybe in the corporate world, our boss, to be a wiser person than his servant. Now, I don't find that to be ironic. If it wasn't by working smarter as well as harder, how did he get to be the boss in the first place? And so I'm inferring here that the person above us worked smarter along with working harder to get to that position. Now, this is not etched in stone. There, there may, may very well be truth to all of this. But whatever may be wisdom's role in enabling people to climb that ladder, and get this, it's still a fact that the higher we go, the harder it is to hold on to that wisdom. When people think they know it all, they really don't know very much. And by the way, we know people like that in our lives. We even apply the tag to them. Oh, he's a know-it-all. Now, that doesn't preclude the fact that this person may be smart, but there's no one out there that knows it all. And with that, the servant has some disadvantages that are obvious. But let's remember that the servant, and remember the title of this is a servant's opportunity. The servant has one thing going for him. He may have a few things, but I've chosen this one. He has a better chance than his master to learn from life simply because of the humble circumstances of life that are those from which we learn the most. We learn the most from the humble circumstances of life. I had parents that lived through the Depression. The Depression made them smarter. Uh, money was not available. Jobs were scarce. It, it was not a good time in this country. And yet they made it through. And what they did was they carried the principles that they learned when they didn't have very much into a time when they had more. Now, people might call my parents cheap and probably they were. A more polite term is frugal. And that is because they remember the times when they did not have a lot. When they came from humbler circumstances. And it is from those humbler circumstances that we can learn the very, very important things of life. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. And we will see some kind of interesting words here that have been transposed into our New Testaments. Deuteronomy 8, 3. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. These were exactly the Lord's words in our New Testament. The manna. Do you think they got that? How, how does this bread-like stuff appear daily? 
That, that is so miraculous to me. And you know what? They didn't understand it. They just ate it. And they followed the rules that are, were, were involved. So not only that, the humbler circumstances are those that keep us more opened. And if you would, a, a word that I liked as an ex-teacher, that keep us more teachable, that keep us in a teachable frame of mind. We must always want to learn more about the important things in life. You ever wonder why some of these people on Jeopardy know so much? Well, it's because they pour through things. They, they try very hard to read things that will make them more knowledgeable in certain areas. Does that make them wiser? Not necessarily. It just fills their head with facts that they are able to recall. By the way, uh, the ability to recall is a, is a, a wonderful uh, attribute that we have. Now, uh, backing up this thought, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 13, Solomon, the ecclesiastical writer, says, Better a poor and wise youth than an old foolish king who will be admonished no more. A wise youth. A wise youth means that a youth that is yearning to learn compared to a king who thinks he knows it all that will be admonished no more. And so with that in mind, as we come near the end of this lesson, if wisdom is a priority, and remember uh, in James, uh, James says, if any of you would want to be wise, go to the Lord for that wisdom. If wisdom is a priority with us, let us be careful about the things that we aspire to. The things that we aspire to in this world. A servant's mentality. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. Peter didn't get it. When it was explained to him, he literally said, wash me all over. The servant's mentality is to indeed serve others. Um, we should be the foot washers, not the foot washies. We should have this desire to have the servant's attitude, the servant's opportunity. How does that come? That comes when we understand that being humble is the beginning of wisdom by understanding that uh, we don't know a lot of things and wisdom comes from our desire to indeed learn. The great poet William Wordsworth said it this way, Wisdom is oftentimes nearer when we stoop rather than when we soar. When we stoop, when we bend over to help someone, then when we soar and think that we have everything that we possibly need, that we have the world by its tail and we know everything and we don't need to know anymore. Pride is indeed the arch enemy of wisdom. When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. God wants us to search his word. He wants us to know more about what we would have to do with our lives to serve him. 
And we do this by serving others. It is the servant's opportunity. Here on earth, we have that opportunity to be servants of the Lord as we wash the feet of others, as we serve others. Let's make sure that we understand that there, there's real wisdom and there's false wisdom. There's the people that know it all and the people that want to learn more and more about the Lord's word. Let's be the latter. Let's be those people who take advantage of the servant's opportunity to become wiser in the ways that our Lord wants us to be wise. As children of God, we're able to use that wisdom. We're able to use that wisdom to further the cause of Christianity in the world. And if you haven't become a child of God, the scriptures point out very clearly what must be done. We must indeed confess Jesus as the Son of God. We must repent of our former lives and be baptized for the remission of our sins. If that's the state you're in and you find that need, contact one of us so that we can help you to, to become one of God's children. Confession is also important. If you need to confess, confess to the Lord. If you find the need to confess one to another, please do that also. I hope this lesson was good for you. I hope that as you reflect upon it, that uh, it will uh, find a place in your heart. Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity that we've had to uh, just take a little time out from our lives to, to sing praises to you, to observe your supper, and to hear a portion of your word. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we seek to be wiser. Help us not to allow pride to get in our way of, of learning more about what you would have us to do with our lives. So we will indeed take advantage of the servant's opportunity that we have to do good to all people around us. We have people on our prayer list, dear Heavenly Father, that, that here at Northfield that, that we need to look at and that we need to pray for. We pray that you would bless them that uh, have asked for our prayers and that we would take them into our hearts and uh, have them as part of our prayer life. Continue to be with us. Continue, dear Heavenly Father, to admonish us when we're wrong and help us to understand that uh, we just need to uh, be the humble servants. We need to bend over to help people rather than think we soar. Bless us. Be with us. I pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above.